Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, thank you very much for the org to the organizers, to Tim Flannery for inviting me to come over here to Australia from New York. Um, I, uh, great organization, um, just with the weather. I, I had hoped to, uh, to have a bit of sun. Um, I, I'm not sure where you put it. Um, so if I dance around here a little bit because I'm cold, then, then don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll warm up. Um, thank you very much for inviting me in this wonderful place. It reminds me a bit of home. I'm from Germany, uh, where we have a lot of these illustrious um, buildings. We don't have that really in upstate New York, where I work at the moment. Uh, so I enjoy very much seeing that. Um, I'm talking about carbon. I'm a carbon scientist. I'm a soil scientist. Um, and we've been watching closely uh, what is happening on the climate stage, because we feel that working with soils and soil carbon is central um, to what happens in the climate debate because it has by now been unequivocally proven that climate change is a reality that humanity has to face. The 2007 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has put the signs of climate change and global warming on, on solid scientific footing. And what is more, global fossil fuel emissions have far exceeded the worst case scenarios um, that were predicted in these IPCC reports several years back. And there are some alarming signs and, and calculations that even if we were to completely reduce fossil fuel emissions right now, if we would shut off all these lights uh, and monitors, um, we would still have CO2 in the atmosphere for many hundred years to come that would warm the planet. So we, we need to find ways not only to reduce emissions, we need to also find ways of drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. But we're not unarmed. We can do something about it, even if it's, if it's challenging. Um, addressing climate change really means uh, uh, that we have to have an effort that stretches across all sectors of the global economy. Carbon forms are the most important um, greenhouse gas in, in the debate. Uh, that does not only include um, uh, carbon dioxide, but also methane and, and soot from fossil fuel. But this carbon, the same carbon, is not only in the atmosphere as CO2, it's also in forests, in crops, in plants, in soils. Actually, soils contain more than 80% of the organic carbon on land. So there's a lot of carbon in soils. And there's several more several fold more carbon in soils than there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we're dealing with a lot of carbon in, in terrestrial environments. And, and even all that carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere cycles every 14 years through the plants, through the soils, and back to the atmosphere. So that's a, that's a huge amount of carbon that is pumped from the atmosphere into plants, into crops, into forests, into the soils, and back out again. That means that, that these plants are a huge conduit for, for carbon um, and, and dwarf the amounts of, of carbon in the atmosphere. And we, we, we can use that carbon. We can use more carbon in our crops and in our soils. Um, carbon in soils, especially in Australian soils, is very important to soil health and soil productivity, as any farmer will be able to tell, tell you, but also filtering water and benefiting biodiversity. An estimated 34 gigatons of carbon is found in Australian soils. And even if we were to jack that up by 1% only, that would be a several-fold um, drawdown of CO2 compared to the entire fossil fuel emissions um, from Australia. So we, we should and must use that opportunity to the fullest. Through historic times up to now, we have lost about 80 gigatons of organic carbon from our soils worldwide as a, as a result of agricultural activities. That is one order of magnitude greater than our annual emissions. And if we restored um, uh, those amounts of carbon that we have lost through time from our soils, um, we, would, we would draw down atmospheric levels to, what, to levels that most scientists would believe are safe levels of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. While there are necessarily many approaches to mitigating climate change and finding solutions and getting back 
carbon back into farms and forests, I want to introduce one particular um, approach um, that, uh, that is possible in the near future. Just as, a, as an introduction, what can be possible uh, and that we have not exhausted our options but must act actually fast to explore the potential. Let me take you on a little journey that will take us to the Amazon uh, 8,000 years ago, a long time before the arrival of the Europeans, actually. Indigenous populations created um, a soil that is now called uh, Terra Preta Jeindiu. These are fantastically fertile soils that store a very large amount of carbon uh, in, in, uh, in, their, in their soil. Um, and these so-called black soils of the Indios were first described quite some time back by Francisco de Orellana 500 years ago, one of the first Spanish explorers in the area. But we've learned actually the lessons from this finding only recently. The black color that is in these soils is um, from uh, black carbon or charcoal carbon that we call biochar if managed. So what, what is this material? This material is produced by heating organic matter, biomass, crops, wood, in the absence of oxygen. That means a pot with a lid on um, to prevent burning, uh, but in, uh, induce charring. Um, and and you, know all, you know that very well because uh, you are very familiar with charcoal making and, and I hope you all enjoy uh, a, a barbie on the weekend um, if the weather is a little bit better than this. Um, what's so special about biochar, this char carbon in soil, only became clear a few years ago when it could be demonstrated that char carbon uh, has some very interesting properties that make it able to retain nutrients in water better than other carbon in, in soil. You're all aware um, that carbon in soil is good for soil health, uh, that carbon in soil, humus in soil, improves water holding capacity, soil tilth, physical properties, chemical properties, biological properties, promotes microorganisms. And interestingly, biochar has been found to do all these good things, but just more efficient and for a much longer period of time. But these char types of carbon can be actually found in, in anywhere in, in the world, almost. It's part of the element cycles. And especially here in Australia, char is practically found in all soils. And there's been a very vibrant um, scientific and, and industry community um, that tries to explore this, this knowledge uh, a bit more. 20% of the soil organic carbon in Australian soil seems to be char carbon. And recent research has shown that the stability of this char is one to two orders of magnitude greater than other carbon in soil. That's a huge difference. Being able to prolong the life of carbon, of humus in soil by one to two orders of magnitudes affords possibilities um, to, to draw down carbon in, in unprecedented ways. An important aspect of carbon cycles in, in soil uh, is to understand that plant matter is not simply accumulating as soil organic matter, but they need to be stabilized. A leaf that falls as a crop residue uh, from the plant to the soil um, where mineralized very, very quickly, and the carbon would be um, uh, outgassing very, very quickly as CO2 if it weren't for the soil matter, if it weren't for the, for the minerals to protect the carbon, uh, if it weren't for aggregation to protect the carbon um, against microorganisms, uh, interactions between mineral surfaces and organic matter uh, that prolong the life. The reason for the um, huge stability of char carbon in soil is that it's mainly a chemical recalcitrance. And, and it's important to realize that if you put carbon in soil, you'll easily understand that you will get more carbon um, retained in the soil. However, there is a barrier, a saturation point, beyond which the carbon cannot accumulate, uh, the soil cannot accumulate carbon. And this saturation point makes it very inefficient uh, from an early, early point onwards to retain carbon. 
with char or charcoal carbon you can break through this saturation point and actually store much more carbon in the soil than you were uh, able to without, without the char. But when we talk about, about um, uh, storing char in soils, we must realize that this is in the context of the, of the carbon cycle. We must um, use uh, uh, the, the photosynthetic ability of the plants because at the beginning, the carbon from the atmosphere is taken up by the plants as part of, a, of photosynthesis. And in a normal, in, in a normal natural system uh, without char, development, uh, you'll find that the carbon is, uh, is uh, um, returned back to the atmosphere via the soils uh, through the microbial action. But if we were to, uh, able to prolong the life of the carbon in the soil by converting the carbon that would otherwise have been recycled in the biological carbon cycle very quickly to the atmosphere in a much slower cycling biochar cycle, we can retain a lot more carbon in soil that does all the good things that you're very well familiar of. At the same time, we can um, weave this conversion technology into a technology that not only produces char, but also energy. That not only uses prime biomass, woody biomass, but can also use byproducts um, of agricultural uh, activities, can even use uh, manures um, or other carbon materials that uh, are currently landfilled or, or not used otherwise. We'll have to look at, at, um, uh, at the uh, um, opportunities for, for carbon management from a systems perspective. The systems perspective is really, and systems thinking is really the key in agricultural watersheds. Because only if we look at, at how we can find the synergies between our carbon um, that is produced in agricultural watersheds, the energy needs, uh, the needs for soil fertility management, um, and uh, the need in this context um, for uh, climate change mitigation, we'll find uh, the, the, um, uh, the synergies that, that, um, that will help mitigating climate change. The challenge is to find uh, ways of, of um, uh, uh, harnessing these synergies um, and, and realizing that there are always trade-offs in agricultural watersheds between uh, the, the carbon that needs to go into the soil versus the carbon that is used for fuel, for fiber, or for food production. We only have a finite amount of carbon. And I'll sometimes use the, the, the example of, of an Ethiopian farmer um, who knows very well to put the crop residues and the biomass into the soil to improve soil organic matter. But they can't do it because they need to feed the animals. They know very well that they should put the animal manure back into the soil to improve soil organic matter and to improve crop productivity. But they can't do it because they need to take the manure to, um, uh, to, uh, to heat uh, the houses or, or to cook their food. So the knowledge is there but there's very often not an opportunity to, um, to use this knowledge because there are multiple constraints on the carbon uh, on farms. So we need to, we need to find the sweet spot uh, where we can get energy out of the uh, biomass, but at the same time return the carbon to the soil uh, and at the same time uh, use waste biomass that has no other, um, uh, might even be detrimental to, to environment. What can such a system do on a global scale? As with any other strategy, we can't really afford not to find out. As I mentioned before, large amounts of carbon are cycling through the biosphere into the soils and out again, about 60 gigatons per year. If we can deviate only a small portion of that carbon from this fast cycle into a slower cycle that enriches and restores soil fertility where needed, we can draw down significant amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. The technical potential of, of these systems, um, be it uh, 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 tillage systems uh, or biochar systems, has, has been estimated in the gigaton range. 
which puts it clearly into a range where it can be a major player in climate change mitigation, if we choose to do so. How can this work? We need the right incentives that support climate change efficiency and multiple environmental benefits. We need an incentive system that supports delivery of environmental goods and enables in innovation and does not stifle it. We need an incentive system that does not pick winners or losers, but puts a premium on meeting all societal needs. And there's, of course, never one solution. There's only a toolbox that we need to fill with tools that can be adapted to local needs and preferences. And that's, that's also something, um, as Nick mentioned, uh, there, there, a lot of action happens in the periphery. Uh, we need to look at, at the local opportunities because as agricultural watersheds can be as diverse as you can imagine, bi biomass flows, needs for products change constantly. Weaving a technology such as biochar into conversions that we are already doing on a daily basis or carbon conserving tillage practices into soil preparation is not a huge step in engineering and biomass handling, but can be actually a gigantic step in climate change mitigation and restoring soils where it can improve soil productivity. Practical examples include um, uh, deviating agricultural waste from landfills, as I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, 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 examples such as empty fruit bunches from, from uh, uh, oil palm production, replacing burning of plant residues with charring, uh, switching cooking and heating systems from burning to charring. These are all examples that can be known right now. In some cases, such changes are happening because of benefits unrelated to climate change mitigation. Again, organic, farms, uh, organic carbon is good for soils, as, as any farmer and, uh, and homeowner and gardener will know. In other situations, it's not happening because of multiple demands for biomass as food, fiber, and fuel, because it's cheaper on the short run to burn trees, for instance, infested with a pine bark beetle in, in British Columbia and the, and the western US. Because it's not yet economical to monitor carbons in farms and forests as easily as it is mon to monitor a carbon coming out of a smokestack of a coal-fired power plant. But that doesn't have to be like that. But admittedly, the distributed nature of biomass handling is variable, and that has defied simple measures of carbon drawdown. And it's undoubtedly difficult to prove that emissions have occur emission reductions have occurred and that carbon is stored in soils and forests or other products. But in my, my view, this is a matter of investment into smart monitoring systems. And rather than launching new initiatives, uninformed and repeating past mistakes, we should be investing in exploration of a new generation of biomass and carbon handling systems on farms. And those that recognize the multiple needs of food, feed, and fiber. It's not understandable to me, for instance, that carbon sequestration in soils would fail to qualify for carbon credits because that it, of the fact that it also has soil fertility benefits. And yet, this may be one of the hurdles to take. And stackability of those environmental benefits should, in my view, be an asset rather than a hurdle and an argument against soil carbon sequestration. A global deployment of, of these type of initiatives, such as biochar, are still a few ways in the future, but full ev evaluation at scale of implementation must occur now to capture the environmental benefits of such systems. And the same effort must be put behind all approaches that generate environmental value across all sectors of society to benefit. Thank you very much.